Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world, and welcome to today's webinar, Engaging Your Citizens and Archiving the Social Conversation, How Travis County Ensures Transparency with Social Media, brought to you by Government Technology, Emergency Management, and Archive Social. I'm Harold Tuck, and I'll be your moderator today. We have just a few announcements before we begin. This live webinar is designed to be interactive between you and the presenters. You can participate in the Q&A session by asking questions at any time during the presentation. Just type your question into the Ask a Question text area next to the video window and then click the Submit button. At this time, we recommend you disable your pop-up blockers. You will see a number of widgets on the bottom of the screen as well. During today's webinar, you can connect with your peers via LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. If you are experiencing problems with your media player, you can select a preference link under the video window and choose a different media player. If you are experiencing any other problems, please visit our webcast help guide by clicking on the help button below the video window. So let's begin our presentation for the day, and again, welcome. A few words about the Center for Digital Government. We provide uh, award-winning presentations, and we also provide thought leadership in running technology as a business for state and local governments. We also are an advisory institute and a national research firm. I am joined today by Rosanna Barrios from Travis County, Texas, and Anil Chawar from Archive Social. I will introduce them in more detail later on. But the question for today is, what's happening with social media and government? Well, as you look at this chart, the one thing I would want you to have a takeaway is that it is not just the millennials and younger generations that are involved in social media. In fact, over half of, of the statistics here are baby boomers, and it shows that the baby boomers are indeed very active in social media. When you look at the social media landscape, and this snapshot changes as we speak, review the various logos on this, in this, on this slide, and the question of, that you need to ask yourself is how would you manage this? So what are driving these trends today? Well, the hyper-connectivity of the Internet. We, we can get online virtually anywhere we want to be. And as a result of that, visitors and residents have more opportunity to use social media that government would have to respond to because there's such a critical mass. I mean, almost 3 billion people, and it is a predicted that 3 billion people will be connected to the Internet by the end of this calendar year. That's an uh, awesome number because that's about 40% of the world's population. So look at these statistics. These statistics represent the activity that occurs in social media every 60 seconds. When I first saw this, I was simply amazed, amazed. So what does this mean for, for government? Think about that as I ask you this poll question. What is your opinion on social media as a public record? One, it is definitely a public record by law. Two, it might be a record, but our activity is not worth retaining. Three, it might be a record, but our activities, oh, it, it, that sort of repeats itself. And finally, you don't know. While, while you're answering the question, I would like to introduce the speaker who will follow me, Rosanna Barrios, Policy and Planning Manager, Information Technology Services, Travis County, Texas. A self-described Austin transplant, Rosanna Barrios has resided in Austin since 1983. Rosanna is the Policy and Planning Manager for the Travis County Information Technology Service Department. She manages strategic planning and tactical initiatives regarding business administration, emerging technology, and IT policies and best practices. She oversees the county social media administration, participates in research, planning, evaluation, annual budget process, and, reviews and, 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 and the review and implementation of project management solutions. From 2006 to 2009, Rosanna was the chief of staff to, the, to Brewster McCracken, 
former mayor pro tem on the Austin City Council. Her policy areas include emerging technology and te- telecommunication, affordable housing, health and human services, cultural and art policy, and public safety. So before we hear from Rosanna, let's review the results of the survey. Almost two-thirds of you say that your opinion of social media is definitely a public record by law. Almost 9% of you says it might be, but it's not worth retaining. And uh, over a quarter of you don't know. So we hope to be able to answer these questions uh, as we um, progress in our presentation. Welcome, Rosanna. Thank you, Harold. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to speak a little bit about the makeup of Travis County as an organization. Um, Our IT department falls under one of the divisions that reports directly to our commissioner's court. The commissioners meet every Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock for a voting session. So this morning, uh, being Tuesday, we've had a commissioner's court meeting. As a group, the commissioners and our county judge are the chief policy-making and administrative branch for county government. And among their many functions, the commissioner's court sets the tax rate, it determines the fees for many county services, and also determines how the collected revenues will be distributed among the different county departments to provide services to the community, to our constituents, Travis County. And as you can see by this chart, uh, Travis County has a high number of elected officials. We're uh, 48 plus county officials, and those elected officials um, include many that have judicial authority. This high level of elected officials creates an organizational structure unlike other more familiar public sector designs, um, which usually contain a chief executive or a chief operating officer and a governing body that focuses on board policy matters. Travis County, however, currently operates without a COO or county executive for the court. Consequently, there's a challenge for unified communication, but it's a challenge that the county is certainly addressing, and we're addressing it through the use of social media. And just to give you a little background on the on how social media became part of Travis County, um, September 4th, 2011, Bastrop County, which is our neighboring county to the east of Travis County, had a huge uh, forest fire that erupted. I call this, uh, in my opinion, the catalyst to how the county began implementation of social media. The fires uh, around Bastrop County and Bastrop County were ravaging and neighboring counties were stepping in as well as our state and federal emergency services to assist this massive fire. But there was a big missing component and it was um, social media. We did not have anything in place that would provide an outlet in that aspect for Travis County to disseminate information, which as we all know, for those of us who use social media, is it's in the moment. It is instant. There were a few county staff that I'm aware of who were sharing information via their personal social media pages. Um, in particular, there was at least one county staff who went and sat at what is our combined Travis County Emergency Management Services Communication Center. So again, this was clearly a big challenge to us and that we were not able to communicate through any established social media platform. But, and unfortunately so, it was because of these bass drop fires that we were now tasked with addressing the issue of developing a social media presence. And this request came directly from one or I believe two of our county commissioners. And the um, immediate task was given to our IT department. Um, what have what have been some of our challenges that we've seen in the process of trying to implement implement social media? Well, I think it's important to know that currently Travis County does not have a central communications department. That means we don't have a public information office, not officially. 
we have a couple of spokespeople who regularly address the community and media when needed. Um, but again, we don't have an identified public information office. I also think another big challenge to um, the implementation has been that we don't have an official social media policy. That's to say that there's nothing in place that has been adopted by the Travis County Commissioners. We have um, a draft document in place. It is pending as an agenda item. Uh, however, again, it's not yet been adopted by our Commissioner's Court. We also lack a, a, an organized uh, training module. We've, uh, there are several people that are working on putting together some processes, but we don't have anything that's documented as a training module that our staff can use. And this is staff who are currently engaged in social media content management. For me, I think another, uh, another big challenge, um, and I don't think it's anything that would be unique to any government agency, but we don't have a social media budget. And I speak specifically with regard to uh, the ability to promote pages, to um, get out there and get people, you know, whether likes are counted or not, but to, uh, again, promote, promote our presence um, outside of uh, what we're doing within the agency. There's also um, a challenge to, uh, with regard to analytics, how we monitor and track those to gauge effectiveness. We do utilize uh, the Facebooking tracking feature to report on performance, and I share this because I will, I will go at least once a month to our Facebook pages and um, through, again, the Facebook tool, we'll provide insight to our chief information officer on where we are, you know, how many people have been engaged or responded, how many likes we've gotten in the last 30 days. So that's the level of analytics that, um, I, that we are currently implementing. As far as performance goes, um, we're still working very much um, aggressively through this. I, along with the web team and other county staff, are working to put um, oversight processes into place to ensure um, not only the accuracy of our social media posts, but that we're not running into each other as uh, various content managers throughout the organization. And then finally, culture. And I think that a lot of you who are in government probably can relate to this because um, Travis County as an agency um, has been slow to embrace social media. Um, I think there's a challenge in developing a plan for how we allow our county employees, again, we are over 5,000 employees within this agency, so how do we allow our employees to advocate for the county? Uh, we recognize that employees have huge networks that span beyond uh, our reach as an agency, but again, there's just that huge challenge for our ability to train employees so that they are better able to advocate through social media. What are our accomplishments? Well, uh, first off, I think that there has that even though the social media growth has been slow, again, you reminding you that you know it was 2011, and actually probably more like 2012 before we actually had any of our pages up in place. So, social media growth, I think, has been slow for Travis County, but it's been steady. Um, especially given that there's no money in the budget for any campaign initiatives, and I think this is another um, another relevance that other county agencies can relate to that, um, that we're not unlike other government pages. You know, it's interesting, I was speaking earlier about how our weather alerts will garner all of a sudden a big spike. So if you can see from this chart, you'll see like in February, we had this huge spike of likes on our page. Well, part of that is due to inclement weather. We had ice days within Travis County. And uh, so it was interesting to watch how many how many pe people were visiting that post and also following up to see how many people were liking it as a result of inclement weather. So uh, I think that this also demonstrates uh, with regard to accomplishment how social media is working um, r relative to how people are engaging or coming to a page to to get their information.
So let's talk a little bit. I'll share with you um, a little more detail on social media implementation. I spoke earlier about uh, that that uh, social media arose out of the um, the tragedy that was the Bastrop fires, but. But through this, we also were made more aware of a need for us as a county to be more transparent, to have these interactive relationships with our constituents. And in that regard, I am proud to share that I believe that that Travis County has established an active social media presence. And through through the work that we've done as an ITS department, along with my colleagues that are the web team. So this is just a little snapshot that you're seeing of uh, pages that have social media presence that our web team has put together. And you'll see the various icons. Uh, obviously, most of them are Facebook. We do have some Twitter accounts within our other county departments, um, like TNR, um, and um, it's, again, just giving you an idea of the landscape of the county social media presence. So you see we have Twitter, we've got YouTube, obviously Facebook, and ITS staff has reached out to Travis County residents with news and information about the county, and we've fielded questions and inquiries that come across our social media accounts from our citizens. Um, my work as our policy and planning manager in setting up a social media presence has been done greatly with in conjunction with our county attorney's office, um, specifically to understand uh, that for for those of us working in social media with regard to open records. I've also worked with various county staff, as I've mentioned. The ITS web team has been hugely instrumental in ensuring that we have this presence because they're, they are the ones who do most of our most of our monitoring and a lot of the posting information or requests that they may receive through the community as well as our other county departments. So I think this also is a tool to recognize how social media can not only provide collaboration within an agency, but obviously outside the agency as you work to better serve your constituents and you encourage and support other county departments that want to create pages and have social media accounts. So um, for me, that's been, again, something that I look at that uh, is a huge component to working better together as an agency and working better together as an agency to serve our community. So what's been the impact of social media with regard to open records? Well, again, I think because we are fairly new to the initiative, that there's not been a significant, um, a significant um, relationship in this regard. I've done some checking with our county attorney and our ITS web team just asking for their analytics to see what, you know, what's out there. What are the citizens, uh, are the citizens utilizing social media, Travis County social media, for purposes of open records requests? And what the information that I received was that there's nothing really that's coming directly through social media. But I think the big plus for us as Travis County, again, is the fact that we do have something in place for citizens to come through. I mean, we have our Facebook now. We've got Twitter. If citizens are out there and want to utilize social media as a platform to make these types of open records requests, then um, clearly that's something that we have now in place for them. So this would also be another, I think, accomplishment that we could reference for Travis County. Transparency. Well, I shared with you earlier that the Commissioner's Court meets each Tuesday morning. And so our links, um, what we do with Facebook and Twitter is we provide links to what is the voting session agenda for, for that Tuesday. We will also provide links that uh, will will give the citizens uh, live streaming video access. And those are provided, again, both, both through Facebook and Twitter. Uh, I think another very cool thing is that we use Twitter to post updates um, on item by item um, agenda matters. And so that is a really, a really an, an area where we're giving more of a, 
an in the moment live presence and if and we've got a lot of folks that are following Twitter in that regard. You know, they've become accustomed to this is not only a regular meeting of the commissioners each Tuesday, but Travis County provides through them, um, again, specifically through Twitter, the opportunity to, um, to have those updates. And it's kind of cool when we watch our local media, whether it's um, uh, our local media reporters, newspaper reporters that are grabbing information that is being provided through the Twitter feed. Um, on what is happening in the moment in, in our commissioner court meetings. Um, I also think that what we've been able to do is, uh, and you social media experts out there will recognize this, that because we have the social media in place that we're also providing um, our constituents and our followers a form of listening tool. It's a way that I believe that we give our taxpayers uh, an opportunity to voice their sentiment on issues related to Travis County. But uh, note, and we have, we do have established guidelines on our Facebook page. So when I say we give them a, uh, an outlet for a form of a listening tool, there's also the caveat that we, um, as social media managers and administrators, reserve the right to, uh, if comments have absolutely nothing to do with our brand or the agency, or they're exp explicitly hateful or derogatory, then we reserve the right to, to delete. And again, that is information that we've provided in our guidelines. Um, just recently, uh, we had a, a, a project through our Travis County Transpor Transportation and Natural Resources Department, that's our TNR department, they had a project that they identified as a land, water, and transportation plant. And the department held a series of public forums related to the project. Um, we were able to bring the project manager uh, into, into um, our Facebook content management uh, team and she was out there attending meetings and posting live information as well um, at Facebook and through Twitter. So this was kind of a, a unique opportunity that it was the first time we were actually utilizing the Travis County Facebook page and Twitter in conjunction with another department for a specific event like this, you know, like our like our public meetings. Um, the Travis County Emergency Management Services, uh, which includes what we call our star flight, that's our, our helicopter emergency medical services that we work with in conjunction with local area hospitals. Well, they do a great job as well as helping our citizens stay updated on things like local weather alerts. And for folks that may not reside uh, in Travis County that are out there, you know, we get, especially um, in, during uh, heavy rains, we are prone to uh, some really treacherous flash flooding um, flash flooding incidences and, uh, e you know, even tornadoes through the tornado season. So it's a combination of getting, of, of getting emergency notifications out through combined departments, like I said, emergency management services or uh, star flight and uh, grabbing that information and sharing it on our various pages, but specifically the Travis County page. Um, just with regard to uh, to research, uh, I want to just share that we have implemented the archive social tool uh, fairly recently. It is we began using social me I mean archive social in January of 2014, and so um, one of the things that I think we all recognize that social media content and messages are absolutely no different uh, than email messages. I think what's uh, been benef of much benefit to us as uh, Travis County social media is that Archive Social has put in place a, a tool that helps us ensure that our social media content is being captured, that it's being archived and monitored. Um, we feel that the tool provides a quick and easy access to all of our social media records, and it also enables these records to um, be easily reported in real time. And so that um, in that sense, the application is a form of transparency to our users. 
And and that's all I have. I want to just again thank you for the opportunity to present. I know that there's going to be questions after the webinar that you'll be able to ask, but um and I'm I'm guessing, I'm pretty sure you'll get these uh slide decks available to you after the event as well. And so this is just a little bit of uh, information on how you can contact me if you later have any questions in regard to this presentation. So I'll hand it back over to you, Harold. Yes, you will. And and thank you very much, Rosanna. Excellent, excellent job and very good information. And, and let me just reiterate what she said. Um, within 48 hours of the pre of this webinar, you will receive copies of the slides, uh, that, and you can also share those with your friends and colleagues. And we will be conducting a Q and A session after our next speaker is has concluded. And our next speaker is Anil Chawar, founder and CEO of Archive Social. And just before I get into introducing Anil, I have the final poll question for you all. And so let me ask that now. How is your agency currently retaining records of social media? One, we are not retaining our own records and rely on the networks. Two, we are not retaining our own records. I don't know why this repeats itself, so I apologize. Um, so go down to three, which is a separate question. We use a personal backup tool such as Backify and Social um, Safe, et cetera. And finally, we're a, a happy archive social customer. And while you're answering those questions, and Anil will take us through the results, let me further introduce our next speaker. Again, Anil Chawar is the founder and CEO of Archive Social a Durham, North Carolina-based company that specializes in archive social media for public records requirements. Archive Social partnered with the state of North Carolina in 2010 to launch the world's first open interactive archive of social media. Since then, Archive Social has enabled more than 150 prominent government entities such as Charlotte, North Carolina, San Francisco, California, Raleigh, North Carolina, and Austin, Texas, to name a few, to ensure a large trans term transparency for government social media communications. The company was selected for the prestigious Code for America Accelerator in 2013 and recognized as a 2014 cool vendor in government by, by leading analyst firm Gartner. Anil has spent more than a decade developing innovative software solutions and is a subject matter expert on social media records management. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Computer Science from Georgia Tech. And welcome to the webinar, Neil. Harold, thanks so much for the introduction there. And thank you to all of you who have carved out some time on your Tuesday afternoon here to uh, listen in on this webinar. And uh, of course, thank you to Rasana for sharing your story. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, challenges that you face um, that other counties and municipalities are facing. Uh, and hearing how you approached it is certainly helpful in terms of bringing all that distributed information under uh, one house uh, in terms of your social media strategy and your record keeping. So I'm going to go with Archive Social. We do have a poll up on the screen right now. Uh, I realize the poll has some kind of glitch in it today. So I'm going to go ahead and move forward, uh, at least see what kind of results we got out of this poll. So hopefully um, those of you who are going to respond, responded. Uh, and we'll bring it up. And what we see, uh, and this is typical across our audience uh, base as, as we go around the country talking about this issue of social media as a record and archiving, uh, is that most municipalities today, somewhere between 60 to 80 percent, depending where you are, um, are not doing anything to, to particularly retain these records outside of the social networks, We're just relying on Facebook and Twitter to have this data. Now, I, I do see some of you um, are using uh, a backup tool like Backup of Fire Social Safe. And, I'm extremely happy to see that we have some Archive Social customers on the line today, so thanks for taking the time to tune in. Now, our intention with these polls, uh, and particularly the first poll around public record, is to really gauge where the state of thinking is today in terms of our audience uh, here in Texas in regards to social media as a public record. And I'm going to funnel that information, those, those results from those polls, uh, into my presentation here and really focus on, on uh, you know, the perception of social media as a record and, and help I hopefully clarify your view. I uh, certainly want to share my view on it, but also really share what the industry is thinking on this issue. 
So uh, that's, in a nutshell, my overall goal. A quick agenda here is that I'm going to make the case that social media is a public record, uh, but I'm going to do that by not just talking at a you know, high philosophical level, but really give you some real-life examples uh, and legal case studies uh, so that you can understand the urgency and the importance of this issue. A uh, key goal in this webinar, of course, is not just to, to talk about this problem, but to give you some solutions. So I hope to give you a handful of different solutions that you can uh, potentially adopt based on your own situation. Uh, with time permitting, I do want to give you a quick live demonstration of what it means to archive social media and, and how you can access that information uh, using Travis County's archive. Uh, and then, of course, we do want to carve out some time for questions. Now, please do, as, as the other uh, speakers have, have uh, asked, you, asked throughout the session, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. Uh, we'd love to see those pop up throughout so that we can immediately address those um, as we wind down here at the webinar towards the end of the hour. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and jump into the, to the issue of social media as a public record. I know more than a quarter of you, about 25% we should say, uh, we're unclear on whether social media is a record or not. Uh, we've actually done quite a bit of, of, of you know, talking and, and attending events there in the state of Texas. Uh, and we see that Texas, in Texas you take your, your Public Information Act quite seriously. So I'm going to start, I am going to start a little bit uh, higher level just to give you the law, the text of the law and why social media is a record, but then I'm going to go into those examples. Um, when we look at your Public Information Act, we see um, the kind of language that we frankly see in, in every public records law across the country, which is basically that um, communications that are created by, transmitted to, received by governmental body, regardless of their physical form, these communications are government records, public records, just like, uh, uh, you know, just like, just like they were on paper, just like they were on email. Uh, and to Rosanna's point, you know, again, Travis County has acknowledged that these are public records and there is a, a necessity to maintain them. Uh, one of the best examples I can give you is to think about receiving a, a customer uh, or citizen complaint. If a citizen complains um, in writing to your city or county, typically that's a record that you maintain for some period of time. Well, the fact that a citizen complaint comes in on a piece of paper versus on an email versus in a tweet really shouldn't matter, and it doesn't. Uh, and we've actually seen not only in Texas but across the country, Florida, Washington, Ohio, Virginia, uh, even in Wisconsin now, we've, we recently saw some guidance come out, North Carolina, and many other states, Records management authorities have come out and said, this language that's been in our laws for decades and decades um, is broad language, but it's intentionally broad to kind of cover any kind of written communication regardless of how technology adopts. Now, the really interesting thing to go beyond that, though, is to look at the state of Texas and what happened there. In fact, last year, uh, September 1, 2013, a Senate bill was passed to update the Texas Public Information Act to make it abundantly clear that, yes, the physical form and, and the modern day forms of communication, um, those, those new types of communications are public records. And so now in the Texas Public Information Act, you'll see that internet posting is listed as an example of the type of media containing public information. And of course, social media is, is a type of internet posting. So that's my spiel in terms of the records law and what really sets the stage, legally speaking, for social media as a record. Now, I know about 10% of you indicated that, well, okay, sure, social media is likely a public record, but, you know, we don't feel that, that our content um, really is worth, is create, we're creating content that's worth keeping as a record. Um, and that's a really fair statement, depending on where you are with social media. But if you are out there um, using it, um, you know, in terms of your day-to-day, -day, in terms of your emergency management, in terms of customer service, um, I really encourage you to take a look at uh, the types of communications that are going back and forth. I'm going to give you a few examples here of social media records and communications that we've seen in the real world that I think without a, uh, you know, beyond a doubt um, constitute public records. Now, the first area where we see uh, these types of records being created uh, is in, in the situation of an emergency. Rosanna mentioned that uh, you know, the devastating fire happened in 2011 um, prior to Travis County having social media. And social media was that one gap um, and really being able to respond and communicate to the public. But throughout the country, we've seen high-profile incidents, crimes, natural disasters, where social media has become the most effective, the most prominent channel for getting information out to the public during an emergency. Uh, the Boston Marathon bombings is a really uh, you know, key example of that uh, from last year. 
uh, and I think a really interesting trivia fact that illuminates how important social media is and the fact that important communications are being created is that when the Boston PD was looking for the suspect, um, the world was watching that Twitter account. And in fact, the very first announcement that the Boston PD had captured the suspect behind the bombings was none other than a tweet. It wasn't a tip to a journalist. It wasn't a posting on their website. It wasn't some other you know, official communication other than a tweet out of the Boston PD Twitter account. And so you can see in these situations that that tweet at that time was the only record of that information coming out of the official body, being transmitted to the public, uh, and is a communication that obviously should be kept for a long time uh, amongst all the you know, hundreds of other communications the Boston PD had, had coming out during that time. And, of course, all of you have emergencies uh, day in and day out. Uh, unfortunately, throughout the country, we have emergencies and these types of crimes. But social media is, 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 is a great boon for you. Uh, and being able to use it openly and rapidly is something that you want to be able to do, but you need to have the records of those communications like you used to have records on the other types of channels that you would, you would previously post uh, those kinds of announcements on. So that's a really obvious example, but um, it's not just you know, the times of crisis. Day to day, we're seeing social media play an incredibly important role uh, in uh, how governments function. And I'm having a bit of a slide delay on my end. There we go. Um, and so what I encourage you to think about as, as a government agency is that um, you know, we all know that government exists to serve the citizens. Um, and it, as you as an agency, what is your customer service? Um, we have an example here on the screen from Texas DOT. I know I've got, I've got at least one attendee here to, uh, from Texas DOT, so thanks for, for tuning in. Um, I'm going to try to relay this example as best as I can. Um, typically, the DOT would be putting information out about, about, about traffic situations um, and providing customer service um, around the traffic. But here's an interesting example that we stumbled upon that I thought illuminates the fact that as a government agency, you're always providing customer service. And that customer service, if it's across social media, it's only being recorded on these channels. Uh, it needs to be maintained as a government record. In this situation, the Texas CSC had a, a citizen, Sheila, that was trying to reach out to them. And there's a whole Twitter conversation behind this where Sheila was trying to call the Texas DOT and she couldn't get through. Uh, and initially, the response was that, you know, we, our phone lines might be a bit tied up. Uh, and ultimately what happened is the citizens determined that, uh, in fact, the number on a mailing was incorrect. And so she was able to tweet to the uh, TXDOT Twitter account and say, it actually turns out this number was incorrect. Uh, and TXDOT, to their credit, said, thank you for you know, letting us know about this. We'll, we'll take care of it. Um, this, again, is customer service happening day in and day out, not even relevant to traffic in this case. But uh, this is a conversation that is a government, you know, a conversation related to government business and, and, and you know, may, may or may not have long-term, uh, you know, real legal implications in any way, but it does have some value and it does fall under a retention schedule and it should be kept. And then finally, Rosanna mentioned that, you know, fortunately, Texas, uh, tra Travis County has yet to receive a public information request for, uh, you know, their social media directly, but um, it is happening across the country. And, and here's an example where Seattle PD, um, which, who's been running a, a number of Twitter accounts for, their, for various uh, police feeds, um, a, a citizen noticed that, that some of these Twitter feeds may have had information that was missing or delayed, and they weren't seeing all of the police incidents reported across these Twitter feeds. They actually started tweeting to Seattle PD um, about this issue, and then a few tweets in actually just said, hey, can you give me the archives of all of those Twitter feeds? Uh, and by the way, please consider this a public records request. So in other words, this citizen made a public records request for social media using social media. Uh, and we, we again stumbled upon this because it's transparently out there. Um, and, and it's a really interesting notion um, that this information, of course, is valuable to the citizen to know whether the Twitter feed um, from the police department could be relied on. Uh, and also being able to just ask the PD, since PD was in conversation on, with, with the citizen on Twitter, hey, can you just consider this a PRA request? Now, of course, Seattle PD came back and said, um, sure, we'll, we'll get you those you know, Twitter archives, but uh, give us three weeks. And if, what we want to talk about in this webinar today is how you can uh, you know, bring that three weeks down to something more manageable. Uh, but a bigger point I want to make here is that, um, sure, Seattle PD received a request for social media records. We've had a number of customers receive requests as well. But um, even if you're not receiving requests specifically for social media, you're very likely receiving requests that include social media. So as a government agency, you're probably used to public information requests that um, are along the lines of, 
any and all documents related to X, whatever X being. Uh, and those types of requests, um, you may try to scope them down to be more specific, but in some cases you have to respond to that broader request of any and all documents, particularly that during times of emergencies or holidays. Your social media accounts probably put out some information related to that topic. Uh, and to really fulfill your transparency obligation there, you should be including social media along with email and other forms of communication. So hopefully that makes the case of social media as a, a public record for the legal definition, uh, as well as makes the case that the content on your social media day in and day out, if you are really ha having you know, communications go across these wires and having a two-way conversation, you're probably somewhere along the lines creating communication that's worth keeping as a Texas record. I'm going to transition to some legal case studies now to say, well, what happens if you don't keep these records and, and why, what is the urgency behind this? Well, the example I'm going to give you actually comes out of case law dealing with email because uh, email has been around for a lot longer. Of course, uh, a decade ago or so ago, we had the same conversation in government about whether or not email is a public record, and of course today we all realize that it is. Um, but because of that, we've had a tremendous amount of case law, and this situation in particular um, deals with something very specific about how the records are being maintained that I think is important for everyone to keep in mind as you start to tackle social media record keeping. Now, this is a situation dealing with the city of Shoreline, Washington, uh, in which in 2006, the city of Shoreline received a public records request for an email that had been sent. Now, the citizen was really interested in the original email, but uh, the city of Shoreline could only produce a copy. And I believe what happened is they forwarded the email to another account, and so they provided that forwarded email. So they provided the copy of the email that was requested, but not the original. Uh, and the citizen wanting that original copy um, made a s subsequent public records request saying, no, I want the original email, and I want all of the original metadata in that email. Now, if you're not familiar with the concept of metadata, what this refers to is, is data associated with data. So if you think about an email, uh, the data of an email uh, is, a, is a content, two or three sentences in that email. But then there's all this other data that's associated with, with those sentences, data about who sent the email when the email was sent, what computer servers they went across, so forth, uh, so forth and so on. So that metadata is embedded in every email, and typically the government entity, you're maintaining that. Uh, but in this case, Shoreline only has a copy and they couldn't produce it. Um, and so this case actually went up to the Washington Supreme Court. And in 2010, the Supreme Court ruled that, yes, in fact, the metadata embedded inside an email is just as much public record as the content of the email. And the Supreme Court file, uh, fined City of Shoreline $100,000, and ultimately the city was forced to settle the case after seven years and ended up paying more than half a million dollars to cover the plaintiff's legal expenses as well. And so this really points out that even if you are doing something to maintain records, whether it's you're relying on Twitter and uh, kind of ensuring that you know, you're, not, you're trying not to delete anything, or if you're taking screenshots or using a backup tool, the way you keep your records really matters. Um, so Shoreline had the email, they just didn't have the exact original copy with the metadata, uh, and it cost them in a big way. Now how this translates to social media uh, is that social media, just like email, there's metadata associated with every social media communication. And one of the most eye-opening examples is when you look at a, a tweet. We all know that a tweet is at most 140 characters, but if you look at the metadata associated with the tweet, there's more than 2,000 characters of metadata. And that's details such as user IDs, again, timestamps, location information, uh, you know, what Twitter client was used to post the tweet, if the tweet's in reply to something, what, what it's in reply to, so on and so forth. Um, and really thinking about this uh, you know, legal precedent we've already seen in email is important as you start to uh, address the social media record keeping requirements. Now one more quick case study, uh, this is a little bit closer to home dealing with social media, but it actually doesn't have anything to do with public information. Uh, the city of Honolulu uh, was faced with a lawsuit in 2012 uh, because their police department decided to moderate some content that they were receiving from a pro-gun group. Now, the pro-gun group was sharing this pro-gun messaging that the police department didn't feel was extremely relevant. Uh, and so the police department simply deleted the post, and at some point I believe they even blocked um, the posters from, from posting further comments. And so the gun group actually... Uh, filed a lawsuit um, stipulating their First Amendment right, freedom of speech, to express their opinion um, on this government page. Now, the case was actually settled earlier this year. Um, the city agreed to pay about $30,000 in the plaintiff's attorney's fees just to settle the case. 
so there was never a ruling on the case, and so we, we really ha- don't have a, a clear uh, legal um, precedent to say whether or not governments can moderate content. Now, here at Archive Social, we, we support government's ability to moderate content, uh, but we strongly encourage you to provide a clear policy that dictates exactly what you, is you, you're going to moderate, make that policy clearly available, and then be very conservative in enforcing that policy, only when it's really clear that that content's in violation. Um, we do have a complimentary social media policy template on our website at archivesocial.com that's c- compiled out of a number of municipalities, including uh, at least one municipality out of Texas. So feel free to, to use that as a basis if, if it can be helpful to you. But the real point here is that, um, you know, besides the moderation issue, is that social media can and will find its way to court. And you've got to wonder with Honolulu deleting these Facebook posts, when they went to court, did they keep any records of what they deleted? Because if they didn't keep a record of what they deleted, it would have been really hard to tell their side of the story. Uh, and I know many of you on the phone today are probably moderating content off of social media. And likewise, think about if that were to come back in a legal situation, how do you sort of show uh, what it was that you were mod- moderating and how it fit within your policy if you didn't keep a record of it? So that takes us to our record-keeping strategies. I'm going to try to move as quickly as I can um, here as we're coming close to uh, Q&A time. Um, and the very first strategy, um, well, let me, let me just say a, a comment here. Uh, now, again, 60-plus percent of you are relying on the social network to keep this data. Um, and what's important for you to realize is that that's not a long-term strategy, only because Twitter and Facebook and these other sites have made zero obligation to government to retain this data. Um, and at the moment that anything is deleted from Twitter, Facebook, and these other sites, it is gone forever. Now, you might think, well, we as an agency are never going to delete what we post. Um, and, you know, hopefully there's no employee of yours that will ever do that. But despite what you do, there's a two-way conversation happening here. And the citizens that are commenting on your post, private messaging you, maybe with crime tips, maybe with complaints, other types of important records, the moment a citizen changes their mind and deletes something that they messaged you or commented or a Twitter mention they sent you, that's gone from these sites. You may not even know that they deleted it. It's gone forever. There are also concerns with citizens you know, deleting their entire Facebook profile, for example. When they delete that profile, it can take all of their previous postings with them. So this content could dis- disappear from under your feet without even knowing it. There's actually studies about a web content information decay slowly disappearing without even knowing it, even though you expect these cloud services to have the data. So just like you wouldn't uh, rely on just one of your employees to keep your you know, Texas uh, email public records just sitting in their Outlook, uh, and instead you actually archive your email probably, um, you want to do something to retain records of social media outside of these networks. Now, the very first thing you can do, again, is, is simply just take a screenshot, um, uh, copy and paste. These are very basic things you can do that don't require any kind of technology. Um, and especially if you're going to moderate content, like I said, you want to have some record rather than no record. So something we, we recommend you do if you are moderating and you have no kind of record-keeping or archiving solution in place, do take those screenshots, but know that this is not a long-term solution because um, this will take up a lot of your time. We have customers, in, uh, particularly in the state of Florida, where they were taking screenshots of their social media on a regular basis and spending between four to eight hours a week taking screenshots of their social media in order, in order, to, in order to have the records they're supposed to have. So it's very time-consuming, and ultimately these records, um, screenshots, uh, aren't the best records, right? Anybody can dispute a, a photo by saying that it was photoshopped or mocked up, unless you have a different way of proving that it wasn't. Now, some percentage of you are using personal backup to, tools, um, like backup of fire social space. And so kudos to you for taking uh, action on this issue. Uh, for a long time in our industry, um, some of the only tools out there were these backup tools that were built for consumers, like backup of fire, that are free or very low cost. Um, and they do a simple backup of your social media maybe once a day. Uh, the nice thing about these tools is they're automated. They get the data directly from the networks. And you have some copy of the data outside of the networks. Now, the downside is that these tools were not built for government record keeping. Uh, and they really weren't built for record keeping. These are backup, which is just having a copy, not records production. So to make that point clear, what we're looking at on our screen here, this is not a backup of five. This is actually a Facebook wall. Now, you wouldn't realize it by looking at it, but many of these status updates and comments are related to each other. So in other words, these comments appear on some of these status updates. Uh, and they happen to kind of appear at the same time. Of course, a comment could show up a week later or a month later. Um, and these kinds of tools are very simple. It's really hard to piece back the information and something like Backupify and reconstruct that conversation. 
The capture is also very basic, so they don't all, it's not extremely comprehensive getting you know, full resolution imagery or getting all the comments after 30 days, things like that. There are definitely some, some data capture gaps. Uh, with a tool like SocialSafe, which runs about $20 a year, I believe, um, you, it does a better job with context, but it stores all the data on your local desktop machine or laptop. Um, so again, you're then having to figure out how to retain that data outside of your own system, which is vulnerable. Um, so these tools are very basic, but they are very low cost. So if you have very lim limited budget, but you are able to find some budget, I would recommend you look at a backup tool today, um, and then in the long term look for more of a records management solution. Now that takes us to all-in-one archiving. So this is where you start to see some real records management solutions um, that can protect you as a government agency. Because, uh, you know, I'll be very frank, if you're going to pay $20 a year for, for protecting your agency, you're, you're going to get about $20 worth of protection out of it, right? So you've got to look for a real archiving solution that's built for this purpose. There are a number of vendors out there, particularly um, those that come from an email archiving background or web archiving background. A lot of these vendors um, are uh, really big in financial services and as an industry, and, and now are starting to, to sh um, you know, put their foot into the, the government vertical. Um, and you know, they provide some nice solutions related to archiving, um, but there are some trade-offs. So what I mean by all-in-one archiving is that oftentimes these solutions are built for something like email archiving, and they're getting social media data and they're converting it to be a, to be in this one archive. And so um, I'd encourage you to evaluate these solutions, but, but figure out what the trade-offs are. If it's an email archiving-based solution, is it converting your data? Are you losing that metadata? Um, is it treating your Facebook conversation like three or four different emails? Is it, is it chopping it up as more comments come in? Can you reconstruct that data? Um, because what we found is that um, having an all-in-one system, it, the setup is one, something you do one time, but really what you need to focus on is how you get that data out. And you want to make sure that these all-in-one systems treat your social media data just as importantly as your other data, such as emails. Now, these solutions do run from a few thousand dollars a year to several thousand dollars, and some of them have setup fees, but something worth looking at if you're able to find the budget. Uh, and finally, what I want to do is wrap up by kind of bringing this all together and saying, here at Archive Social, when we entered this industry uh, just a few years ago, we took a look at these kinds of solutions, and I've given you some pros and cons, and we said, well, what is it ultimately that you want to accomplish? And so I'm going to leave you with these four important factors to think about um, as, you, as you approach social media archiving. The first is frequency. How quickly can you get this data uh, in-house? Because it is out on these other servers and the other networks. And the longer you take to capture the data, there's a bigger time window for it to be lost. Comprehensiveness, you do want both sides of that conversation. You want to make sure you have that metadata, like we saw with the city of Shoreline. This could be important for your legal needs. Uh, authenticity, um, social media will find its way to court. Um, so you want to be able to use your records as evidence if possible. So what is your archiving solution doing to prove the authenticity of that data? Um, and finally, context, which I think is perhaps the most overlooked aspect of an archiving solution. Um, because at the end of the day, it's, it's not about storing data. It's about being able to produce it and make sense of it. So if you are going to archive or keep records of your social media, how easily can you produce that entire conversation that happened three years ago? How, how easily can you replay that Twitter feed uh, and make sense of that data? So those are, those are the criteria that we look for um, in developing a social media archiving solution. We are running out of time, so what I want to do is actually, rather than give you that live demonstration, I want to just refer you to a handful of open archives that we've launched, including the open archive with Travis County, um, where you can actually go and look and see how Travis County is archiving their social media today. It's happening continuously throughout the day, um, many times um, you know, within, uh, within the hours, and um, trying to minimize that time loss. Um, it's comprehensive. All the metadata is being captured. You can actually go find a tweet and look at the metadata underneath that tweet. Uh, and then you're able to replay the conversations, be able to expand out those Facebook conversations, view the photos, replay the videos, uh, and see how, how agencies like Travis County, like Austin, and many others in the state of Texas are um, automatically retaining their social media in a way that they can produce it very easily. I also want to mention the Homish County's archive. Um, you know, Rosanna mentioned that, well, you know, Travis County hasn't, has been fortunate not to have a, a records request. Um, but Snohomish County actually in the state of Washington had an emergency earlier this year. Uh, you may remember, you may remember hearing about the landslide that happened. And social media was at the forefront of Snohomish County responding to that landslide. Uh, and fortunately, they had already set up an ar uh, archive social to capture the data and already created an open archive. Uh, and so after the landslide, Snohomish County received more than 40 public information requests. Uh, and in the situations where social media fell under that request, they were able to 
uh, direct folks to that open archive. I'd encourage you to go to that archive and take a look at it. And I know we're down to the wire here, so the last thing I'll do is put up my contact information. Um, do encourage you to email me or give me a phone call. Uh, if I can be a resource to you, um, I'd love to help out um, and just hear your feedback on what you heard today. Thanks so much. Thank you, Anil. Very informative. I want to be mindful of the time that we said we would take today, so let me just jump right into some um, questions and, um, of the team and, and see what we have here. So here's a question. My understanding of the Act is that we only have to provide people with records that we maintain. If we don't maintain it, we don't have to provide it. Aren't we creating the requirement by archiving the social media? So, Anil, your take? Yeah, that's a really good question, uh, and it has come up um, for someone who's, who's really uh, looked at the Act before. Um, this is I'm, I'm not completely familiar if this is a provision in Texas's Act, but I've seen it around the country where uh, it almost seems like a loophole where if you don't do anything to keep the records and you don't have to produce them, um, and, and, and unfortunately it's not that easy. Um, that provision, when we've seen that in records laws, is really for um, situations where you have like temporary data. So, for example, if you're creating a document, you may have a draft version of it uh, before you have a final copy. And so that draft version is something that you probably won't maintain. Um, and so therefore you won't have to produce that record, but also you will have a final copy that you need to maintain and produce. And that's really what that's intended for. Now if you look at social media, again, social media is not this transitory um, you know, form of communication, at least in all of its usages. Of course, throughout the day you're saying things that are just you know, fun and interesting, but not necessarily uh, of agency you know, business. But with emergencies, with customer service, with, with how police departments and sheriff's offices are using it, how 311 centers are using it, the moment you put something out there that's a government communication of these channels, it's there. It's a real communication. Uh, and it's something that you do need to maintain under the Public Information Act. Uh, and you can't necessarily rely on Twitter and Facebook to have that forever. So, so certainly there is a need to retain this information. It's, it's something that's been, been – what I'm saying here has been um, validated by authorities in Texas um, – and certainly there's a number of agencies like Travis County and, and Austin that have taken action to retain these records. Thank you. Uh, let me um, send this to you, Rosanna, for your first take on the second question, uh, if you know. What happens if a comment is deleted right after it is posted? How quickly can it be archived? I believe that it's um, archived instantly. And so um, – well, I don't know the dynamics, and I'm gonna I'm gonna punt it back to Neil. But my yeah. understanding is, if we do delete something for, um, as I mentioned earlier, inappropriate um, comment uh, that doesn't meet our posted Facebook guidelines, then it is still there within our archive solution. So while the delete may be instantaneous, the the ability to search the deleted item is still there. Neil, you you uh, you want to have a comment on that question also? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Rosanna, you're absolutely correct that if if it's um, if it's in the archive and and it gets deleted off of the original network, um, that's what the archive is there for to have that record for you um, for your retention requirements. Now, uh, one clarification is that with all the different networks out there, uh, instantaneous capture is not always technically possible. And so, Archive Social tries to minimize the window in, in terms of the approach that we take. So we, we offer what we call continuous archiving to try to capture it as soon as we can. Um, but one of the things that we advise, um, our archiving solution provides this, and I'm not sure if others do, is that if you are going to moderate content, uh, before you do that, val verify that it's in the archive. In all likelihood, it should be. But if it's not, what we provide is an archive now button. So you can instantly click that button, and within a moment or two, pull in the latest content from your site, ensure that it's in there as a legal record the way we keep it, and then you can go ahead and delete um, and, and moderate off the original social network with peace of mind. Well, thank okay. you. And then I think I – okay. And I just want to say that Travis County has been very fortunate that we have not had to delete very many comments. Well, that, that good. that's good. That speaks to the people who um, reside there and, and how courteous they are. So that's, that's a good thing. Hopefully we haven't jinxed you today. I want okay. to thank <laughs> – I want to give a thanks to our speakers because we are running out of time, and I want to be mindful to your time. And uh, Rosanna Barrios and Anil Chawa, thank you both very much for participating in our webinar today. Thank you all for attending. I also want to 
uh, thank our sponsors, Government Technology, Emergency Management, and Archive Social. Again, I'm Harold Tuck, and I look forward to seeing you all at another webinar soon. Thank you very much.